Hello everyone, my name is uh, Alberto Asquer. I'm a convener of the MSc Public Policy and Management, Public Financial Management Programs, and as which have been running uh, at SOAS uh, in the last about four, four years. These uh, two programs are not brand new because they've been uh, running at SOAS, uh, well, public policy and management for more than 20 years uh, so far in the distance learning uh, format. And then later we start uh, also on campus and sometime uh, in the future we will probably move uh, to provide also forms of, uh, of a blended learning. But that's so far in terms of the background uh, to our programs and uh, most probably I'd like to spend some time here just to, to introduce uh, what we teach and then hopefully what you can learn uh, out of the experience of studying here, here at SOAS. So let me go back uh, here to, to the slides and uh, especially because I'd like to provide you just an overview about what we cover in these uh, two programs and uh, then I'm happy to, to receive uh, questions uh, if, uh, if you have. So let's start from the MSc Public Policy and Management uh, uh, first. Uh, the MSc Public Policy and Management does uh, what it is written on the can in a sense. So we are broadly concerned with the domains of uh, public policy and the public management. So on the one hand, the, the issues that we face in contemporary societies about uh, deciding that uh, there is a policy issue to be tackled, to identify which are the tools or instruments which can be used by the government or public authorities more generally to fix social or, or economic problems which are perceived in the environment, how to implement policies, so how, how the administrative mas machinery is put to work in order to execute the directives from a government or a public authority, uh, taking into account the resource constraints or other kind of issues which they may face. And then finally, the last important stage of a policy evaluation, where we need to appraise whether policies work or not and what we can learn, can learn out of them. This comes together with uh, uh, some attention also to the public management side, uh, which is more around the administrative machinery in a sense. So there we are covering uh, issues of how to convert a policy into a strategy that a public sector organization should pursue, how to deal with uh, issues of uh, managing human resources, how to measure, appraise and report the performance, especially to the public or to political overseas, and then also to, to deal with the issues of uh, cross-cultural management, which are especially salient in uh, many in many countries uh, nowadays. I should say we touch upon all these areas which are covered generally by the, the scholarly literature from uh, political science, uh, economics, uh, public administration, occasionally with a bit of sociology or even anthropology in, uh, in between. We do not really have any particular country focus. The program is pretty much uh, international. Of course, as based uh, in the UK, we may take a number of examples of the practices and institutions which are present in the UK for making and implementing uh, public policies. On the other hand, in the modules that we teach, we typically take uh, case studies and examples from a variety of countries in the world, both uh, industrialized and developing countries, uh, emergent uh, countries. And uh, we are especially sensitive to the variety of local conditions in terms of uh, institutions which are present there, or in terms of uh, culture, which may affect the working of the society and the government uh, in, uh, in particular. So these are the general features of, of the program, which uh, as a such uh, pays, pays attention to the disciplines, what is in the content there, but also as we are at SOAS, we are pretty much uh, in international. This is uh, typically reflected also uh, in the population of students that we have, uh, we have on campus. And in this, uh, this very year, and the uh, classes which I have, uh, I have about 20 students uh, in the most populated uh, class, uh, and uh, they come literally from uh, everywhere, from uh, Latin America to Europe uh, to South of Asia, uh, from uh, African countries and, and so on. So the population of students is pretty much international and diverse, uh, which comes as a source of enrichment, uh, especially as I invite the students in uh, uh, tutorials uh, to provide the case studies and, and examples out of research from the country where they, where they are from. In terms of the structure of the program, uh, on campus uh, MSc programs uh, are at present uh, structured by having uh, eight modules that students take plus a dissertation. 
The MSc Public Policy and Management consists of four core modules that students are required to take, and then there are four elective modules that students can select out of a list, plus the dissertation. The modules are taken over the academic year, and uh, that means in terms one and two. Terms one runs from the beginning of October until the middle of December, and term two uh, starts in the beginning of uh, January until uh, towards the end of, of March. And uh, typically students take uh, four modules uh, each uh, term so that the workload is uh, evenly, evenly balanced. I would say in about January, February, students start uh, working uh, on their dissertation. They are assigned uh, a supervisor, and uh, during the course uh, of the rest of the academic year, they start uh, polishing the research design, uh, doing the literature review, and they start thinking about the issues of uh, data collection and then data uh, analysis. During the, the second term, uh, specifically, students are expected to take the more research methods, which helps students to strengthen their research proposal, to embark in more detailed study on either quantitative or qualitative data collection and analysis, so that later on in the year they are better prepared to carry out the research for the dissertation. Uh, students take exams uh, in between May and June, but then later, after the exams, typically they find with uh, more time to properly work on the dissertation, which is to be submit submitted by the first half of September. And so typically over June, July and August, the students uh, um, carry out the work on the dissertation until they come to the write-up uh, stage. The four core modules, which are present in the MSc Public Policy and Management, cover these, these subjects. So there is a general module on perspective and issues, which relates to the general theories on political economy, from neoliberalism to other forms of running the economy and intervening in the society, which the country has experienced over, over the years, and at present, in terms of variety, we may have uh, all, uh, all around the world. Of course, it's pretty much up to date. So issues like uh, uh, trade wars uh, that are uh, uh, gone at present and various forms in between uh, countries or regions in the world, or such a dramatic policy shifts uh, like a Brexit, for instance, in this country. These are typically part of the examples and the discussions uh, that we have in class uh, with, uh, with the students. The module on uh, public policy strategy is one uh, where we uh, focus on uh, converting uh, the, um, the policies uh, into actual uh, strategies for uh, public sector uh, agencies. And managing organizational change uh, is, uh, as, uh, as the name says, uh, one where we focus uh, on uh, uh, restructuring public sector entities and providing uh, a new, a different course of direction. And then as a core module, uh, there are also uh, the, the, the research method, the research method uh, one. I stop, for a, I stop for a while also because I'm happy to take questions. And uh, along the way, I noticed this one from Paolo, who asks, uh, are there two applying processes to study a, a MSc in public financial management and uh, in the Department of Languages? Uh, so, um, students, uh, well, prospective applicants can apply to take the MSc in public financial management uh, and they are, they are enrolled uh, as such. Then, of course, uh, as a uh, SOAS uh, student, uh, uh, you, may, uh, you may also have access to all the various uh, resources uh, that you can find uh, here at SOAS. Uh, in part, let me say these are resources about improving your uh, uh, learning skills, uh, but also other kind of, kinds of skills, uh, like writing, uh, for instance. Uh, you have access, of course, to the library, to the career center, and so on. But in particular, the focus of the question is about the languages. And as you probably know, SOAS uh, is, uh, is really excellent in, uh, in terms of the quality of uh, language uh, teaching uh, in a variety of languages, uh, especially, of course, in Asia, Africa, and uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it's quite an excellent uh, center within Europe and, I would say, within, uh, within the world. So I would say it's uh, quite common that many uh, students here at SOAS, including students who take uh, an MSc in public financial management, uh, find the time also to take some language course. 
of course, this can be something uh, students uh, start from uh, from scratch to learn a new a new language, or if they already possess some knowledge of a particular language, uh, the language department can help to appraise the level of knowledge of the language as a baseline and to advise a student which could be the most appropriate level for taking a, a language course on the top of those which they take for the for the MSc. And as I said, many students who come here, they do not miss the opportunity, of course, uh, to take uh, also some, uh, some language uh, courses to enrich uh, their, their knowledge uh, and their CV. Uh, a few more, uh, if I go back to the presentation, a few more words I should spend uh, here concerning the inactive modules. And uh, here I should highlight uh, some uh, clarifications because at present uh, there is a list of elective modules that you can find on the website. So these are uh, modules that, uh, that students can choose uh, for them. And uh, as you can see at the moment, the list uh, which is present on the website uh, is about uh, six modules which are available. But I should say I'm working to expand this list uh, by, uh, for, for next year. Uh, by next uh, department meeting, uh, I'm uh, submitting uh, the request uh, to approve uh, to include uh, more modules uh, into this, uh, this range uh, of, uh, of uh, possibilities. So students, uh, they will have uh, more choices uh, for the selection of their electives. Uh, I can't uh, anticipate uh, which of these electives are because of the formalities that we need to go through an approval process, but I'm proposing that uh, 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 that we include uh, in the teaching of the MSc public policy and management uh, more modules which are focused on regions. So we teach modules uh, about the society and the economy of uh, countries like uh, Japan, uh, China, uh, the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, I'd like to introduce them also into the MSc public policy and management because uh, some students, I believe, uh, they may like uh, to gain some regional expertise uh, and so therefore to become not just expert about public policy and public management, but also to some extent uh, around the economy and the society of a particular countries where SOAS is especially strong in terms of, uh, of expertise. So you may notice uh, some updates, hopefully, on the website in some time to come, although at present these are the six elective modules uh, that officially are on the website of, uh, of SOAS. A few words about the dissertation. So the dissertation is a piece of uh, original research work. Uh, it consists of a piece of work of up to 10,000 words, which is roughly the standard length of an, uh, an academic paper that you can read from an academic journal. And uh, it is uh, submitted in September. Uh, students uh, are uh, just uh, left free, in a sense, to decide the, the, the topic to focus on for their dissertation. Of course, uh, especially during the first term, they, they can pick various ideas uh, of uh, topics and issues they'd like to work on. But on the other hand, uh, it can be nice and convenient if they have already some uh, specific interest or anything which may relate to their own work experience uh, or which may relate to the industry or sector or country where they expect to work uh, in the future to do for the dissertation some research work which already relates to some baseline of knowledge or some interest which the students have. And so they can naturally combine an original piece of research with uh, what they are really, really interested in. And uh, then, of course, the supervisor from about January onwards is there to help uh, students to better frame the research question to tackle in the dissertation, taking, in, taking into account the requirements of originality and the requirements of feasibility in order to come out with a, a good work uh, by, by September. Uh, I stop for a, I pause for a while to take also the, the, another question from Paolo. So he asks, uh, so whether the exam session in the summer covers the two semesters uh, of lessons? And the answer is yes. As it is typical, I would say, in British universities, uh, there is just the one exam session which comes at the, towards the end of uh, the academic year. So in uh, May, June, students have uh, the single exam session where they are required to take models, uh, including those uh, which they may have taken in the first part of the year in term one. This is uh, a general, general rule, because I should say there could be some variation to that. So, for instance, uh, uh, I am uh, proposing to the department uh, to change uh, the way to appraise uh, the modules which I teach uh, in, uh, in, the, in these MSc programs, which are the modules on public financial management revenue and the public financial management financial reporting IPSAS. 
because basically I wanted to move to a form of assessment uh, which is uh, uh, done uh, just uh, uh, during, the, the, during the first term and uh, to require students to do a presentation, to do two pieces uh, of a written work, uh, two assignments, uh, and that would be enough uh, without uh, the exams uh, to be taken in session of uh, May, June. Uh, I believe uh, this is uh, an alternative form of assessment uh, by taking exams. I believe uh, some students may appreciate uh, to some extent uh, uh, being appraised for the modules which they take in the term one by ways uh, which do not uh, require to sit an exam uh, so many months uh, later after they completed the, the module. And uh, if you like, another argument is that we are pretty much aware that nowadays in today's work environment, uh, uh, most of us, uh, they may be expected to write uh, nicer reports, uh, uh, very convincing uh, pieces of research uh, as uh, something much more relevant uh, to our work today, rather than uh, uh, producing uh, uh, original knowledge or debating uh, arguments uh, in the context of a couple of hours uh, of an examination. Where, as you know, we do not have access to internet resources and, and so on. So there are various rationales for starting diversifying the way in which we appraise the students. And so generally, yes, you may expect to sit the exam at the end of the year, but some modules, they may deviate and even not require to take an exam. So I hope that's fine as, a, as an answer, but feel free to keep posting the questions here in the chat, of course. Okay, good. Um, let me move also to say something about the MSc on public financial management, the other one. It's a, it's a sister program uh, which partially overlaps with the one on uh, uh, public policy and management, but the focus of concern is different. If you like, uh, it's a more of a particular take towards public policy and management because one important component part of making public policies and implementing public policies is, of course, uh, to have the money to do it. And so public financial management is specifically focused on how can governments, public sector entities, raise up money, how do they spend the money on public policies and programs and projects, how do they report to the public that money has been properly spent, and how can we audit the activities which are done in public financial management. And so, as you can see, I put here in the slide, the main focus of this uh, MSc program, which is uh, the institutions and practices for planning and budgeting, uh, the revenue side, the taxation and other ways uh, through which uh, uh, public sector entities can raise up the money. Uh, what are the practices in terms of financial reporting? Uh, which are the accounting standards which are used, uh, IFRS or IPSAS especially? And what are the auditing institutions and the practices? And to what extent they can cope with some key issues that we have here, like for instance, uh, corruption and misappropriation of uh, public money in, uh, in many countries uh, around the world. Of course, this is complemented with a, a focus on how public sector operations work. And this is why I mentioned these are like two sister programs, because here we start from a focus on the financial management side. But then, of course, as in, in terms of elective modules, we also include, we also study issues of how policies are made, how policies are converted into strategies, how we measure performance, how does the macroeconomic framework affect the state of finances of governments. I think, for instance, the impact they have on the sustainability of public debt. Uh, for, for example, in the role uh, of uh, financial markets uh, in the contemporary world for funding uh, government uh, operations uh, when investors decide whether to buy or not uh, government bonds, uh, for instance. So in part, uh, uh, the models uh, which are offered uh, in the MSC public financial management are also provided as electives to the public policy and management program. Because, of course, also someone who is especially interested in PPM may, may also be interested to look at how, for instance, a budget is made to allocate funds to public programs. Here, instead, we start the other way around. And so here in the MSC Public Financial Management, first we look in depth to the management of public finances and students may diversify their attention by selecting electives which look at how government operations are managed and how we appraise their performance. 
Uh, here as well, the structure is the same, however, there are four core modules, four elective modules, and then the final dissertation. So I will not repeat, I just highlight here the four core modules for the PFM program. Please apologize for the headline here. This is not about the, the public policy and management, that's about the public financial management program, where the core modules are planning and performance, financial reporting, revenue, and the research methods in management. And uh, there is a number of uh, elective uh, modules uh, like uh, perspective and issues, public policy and strategy, macroeconomic policy, financial markets, managerial accounting, uh, audit and compliance, and regulation of international capital markets. But again, let me say that also here we are expanding the range of electives, hopefully for next year. So we are proposing to include another number of modules which generally relate to international capital markets and the regulation of uh, international capital markets uh, and of the banking sector because of course uh, how finance and banking works uh, has an important impact on the public financial management side. Let me also add that we are adding uh, to these uh, MSc programs uh, also a new module which looks uh, in particular at the state of emergent uh, uh, digital technologies because we also propose the introduction of a, of a new module which is titled uh, uh, distributed uh, electronic ledgers and the blockchain and implications uh, on uh, finance, business, uh, government and society. And this will be a module which looks uh, at these, these new emergent technologies, blockchain, but more generally distributed electronic ledgers uh, and how governments uh, can uh, make use of it uh, either for public policies and uh, for uh, public financial management. So, as you may well know, there are initiatives around the world, for instance, to use the blockchain technology on some areas like, uh, for example, the digital records of the real estate, uh, the cadastro, so that they can provide a better um, way to keep records uh, of, uh, which, of uh, uh, transactions and uh, property rights, which are of relevant also for the public sphere. But there is also an interest towards these technologies, for instance, for the uh, creation of uh, digital currencies, possibly central bank issued uh, digital currencies, which of course uh, may have an impact uh, also the way in which there could be some forms of uh, monetary financing. So the way in which uh, um, central banks can uh, support uh, spending uh, from the side of the government. So we will provide also some uh, enrichment uh, in the areas of uh, contemporary technologies and how this can impact uh, the work of governments uh, either in the making of uh, public policies implementation or in the public financial management side. Uh, sides. So I'm happy to pause for a while for the presentation and to take this question from Rachel and then read it. So it's uh, what kind of academic professional background would you expect from the applicants it sounds like a co-expertise in economics, finance is essential. Is that correct? I should say it is not the case, actually. It is fair that uh, I would say roughly half, uh, probably, of the students we have in class, uh, they do have uh, a finance or economics or accounting background. So some of them may be at chartered accountants, uh, some of them may work in governments, uh, either in central treasuries, for instance, uh, or in uh, audit institutions. Uh, they may be in the career uh, civil servants uh, in the country where they are from. Uh, so they may have either an experience in uh, accounting, finance, uh, economics, or to have uh, a few years uh, of experience uh, in, uh, in government. But it's fair to say that we also received good applications last year from uh, uh, applicants uh, who did not have uh, any background uh, in, uh, in such disciplines. So we have one student in class uh, whose background is in biology, for, for example. But nevertheless, uh, especially because of uh, some work experience which uh, she had uh, and the interest uh, she stated in the personal statement which is attached uh, to application, we believed that uh, uh, the MSc in public policy and management she's taking this year can be beneficial for her career trajectory. And, uh, and so she made an offer and today she's in class uh, taking, uh, taking the modules. Uh, of course, uh, it's a bit of a challenge if you like from the side of us as uh, teachers to provide a baseline knowledge uh, to all students in the class uh, at the very beginning of the, of the academic year so that they are better prepared uh, to understand some issues that we cover during uh, the, the modules. So just to make an example, I have some students who take uh, the, the MSc, Public Financial 
management, and therefore they take the, the module on a financial reporting, uh, which I teach. And a few of them, uh, they do not have an accounting background. So what, what they do every year is to offer to them uh, to have an extra tutorial uh, where I basically try to teach the, to them uh, the very essentials uh, of uh, accounting, uh, the very basics of uh, bookkeeping, uh, how to read uh, a financial statement, uh, so what is in the balance sheet, uh, what is in an income statement. Uh, they do not to, to grasp the technicalities, of course. They will never be expected, most probably, to do any accounting uh, themselves. But they may be expected to read the financial statement and to understand. And so uh, this is the kind of extra support that we offer at the beginning of the academy here to bring, to bring everyone to the same baseline, in a sense. So I hope this helps uh, as, as an answer. I think another question from Paolo. Is it possible to use this master to work uh, in uh, international public entities such as the EU, the United Nations, uh, and, and so on? I would say yes, generally. Uh, let me share with you some experiences. And a number, I should say, of students who take these uh, two MSc programs uh, in the distance learning uh, form, they do actually work, uh, or in any case, they continue their career in international organizations, uh, especially the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the FAO in Rome, and uh, other similar uh, development banks uh, around, uh, around the world. And, um, but also for on-campus students, uh, they find it helpful. So, for instance, I have a student in class who uh, I think she, she did an internship at the OECD. And actually, she told me it was at the OECD where she was advised to look at these MSc programs at SOAS as a something helpful for her. And uh, so to this year, she's taking this uh, MSc program, I guess, because she's interested, as far as I know, in pursuing a career in uh, international organizations. So I hope these couple of examples, they, 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 they're helpful to try and clarify the kind of profile of students that we have uh, in programs. OK, so if there are no questions at the moment, I just uh, move on. So just to conclude uh, that also the MSc in public policy management and public financial management, uh, they have a dissertation at the very end. So the same, it's a, an original piece of research work. It is typically submitted in uh, September. And uh, as I said, the students typically work uh, on something which is of their, of their interest. So again, just to, to mention a couple of examples, last year I supervised uh, a few, a few dissertation uh, projects. One, uh, for, for example, was a, a lady working for the government in uh, Pakistan, and she was interested in some accounting reforms which are taking place in uh, the Pakistani government, especially the introduction of accrual accounting in the public sector. And uh, so she did, she did this piece of research on the issues which are encountered, which are both on the accounting side and the organizational change side. And uh, the, this resulted in a piece of work uh, which uh, looks uh, theoretically at these issues, but also with a lot of empirical evidence uh, on the issues which are encountered in, in uh, Pakistani public sector organizations out of a number of interviews which uh, she did. But another piece of work, for instance, was done by a guy who was interested in uh, public-private partnerships and especially in uh, those which can help uh, countries uh, to, do, to, to raise the revenue out of the exploitation of natural resources. And uh, she did uh, a case study on uh, the PPP, which uh, is enabling uh, the country of Botswana to work with uh, private uh, partners and investors uh, in uh, extracting uh, and commercializing diamonds and the impact that this has uh, on the public finances of uh, uh, Botswana government. So this is just to mention a couple of example, examples of uh, dissertation projects uh, that the students do. Then uh, I have uh, here another question from uh, Paolo, uh, which is about Brexit and how this is going to change the opportunities of working uh, and study, studying in the UK. And uh, I'm afraid that the date uh, of the present uh, uh, webinar, so the 5th of December 2018, uh, there are quite a number of question, question marks uh, around the outcome uh, of this Brexit process uh, which unfortunately prevent uh, from saying anything, anything to say, so probably. So if uh, Brexit is uh, actually going to happen, and if it is, in which kind of form, 
and that there is a spectrum of possibilities, as you know, from uh, nothing happens and that the process is uh, reverted until uh, the very extreme uh, outcome of a hard Brexit and uh, the, the kind of impacts uh, this, this may have. In the, the kind of uh, hard Brexit scenario, it uh, could be the case uh, potentially, but this is just my speculation that uh, any uh, EU citizen may be practically not too different from any other overseas uh, person who is interested to work in the UK, and so there must be a regime of uh, visas to the work visas to to apply. And uh, in that in that case, uh, of course, it could be a matter of uh, a local sponsor to support uh, the application of any overseas. Um, candidate to a work to a work position, but I think we can equally speculate that there are a number of uh, uh, middle range scenarios where some form of uh, let me say preferential treatment could be provided for European Union uh, uh, citizens. And uh, but I, I'm afraid uh, this is too early to say, and uh, I'm not the best person to provide advice in this uh, in this regard. But hopefully everything will be clearer after the end, the end of March. I have another question uh, which says, uh, I have uh, already a master de degree in public policy from India, so I have to apply based on master degree of my undergraduate qualification. But we generally invite uh, applicants to provide uh, the full uh, background that they have, uh, both in terms uh, of uh, um, education and uh, work experience. Uh, then, of course, uh, together with a uh, personal statement and uh, references. As I mentioned earlier, this is helpful because we really appraise the overall profile of a candidate. So, as I, as I mentioned earlier, even someone uh, whose uh, educational background is not really on public policy or economics or finance or accounting, uh, but could be in biology or any other discipline, nevertheless, they may have an offer to study with us uh, if we see that there is a career trajectory which anyway brings uh, to work in the public sector or closely to the public sector. So I just invite you to provide uh, as many details as possible. Practically, on the top of this, uh, I can also mention that, as you know, there is an, an English language requirement uh, for uh, admission. And of course, uh, if an applicant already studied uh, in institutions uh, where the, uh, the education is provided in English, this could be a basis, uh, I believe, uh, for a waiver of the English requirement. Uh, so if you already studied in an English-speaking uh, institution, this can be something advantageous to put in the, the application. So specifically, I would advise the applicant uh, just to, to provide in the application details uh, of both uh, the undergrad qualification and the master degree which they have. Okay, well, uh, thank you. And I can see that the applicant specifies uh, that uh, the, 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 there can be some uh, concern related to the marks that the students uh, received in uh, the undergrad and the postgrad uh, courses, especially if the marks are less, less than 65%, for, for example. Uh, I, I should say that uh, uh, in any case, uh, any more evidence uh, about the background experience, uh, including uh, uh, courses which have been completed uh, with uh, uh, marks uh, which may not be a distinction, for instance, uh, they may not uh, subtract any, anything to the, to the application, I should say. If uh, there could have been uh, a, deg a degree that an applicant did in the past, uh, with the marks uh, which were not uh, too satisfactory, but there was also another degree an applicant took, uh, which was more advanced, possibly with better marks. Uh, my personal advice is, in any case, to provide evidence of uh, all of them, uh, because uh, in any case, we do not really apply harsh threshold uh, to just discard an applicant uh, if uh, at any point uh, in their educational career they could have uh, completed a degree with uh, uh, marks which are not fully satisfying. Uh, I believe one of the reasons which requires students, uh, applicants, sorry, to provide evidence of uh, all of their educational background, but also uh, work experience uh, and a personal statement which outlines uh, their career trajectory and the supporting references. It is uh, really, we provide an overall appraisal 
of, uh, of the applicant. We try and grasp what kind of uh, career trajectory they have. And, uh, and so even if uh, some degree could have been done in the past uh, with the marks uh, which are far from uh, fully satisfactory or far from being a distinction, this by itself uh, is nothing, is nothing uh, which can preclude uh, an offer, okay? If there are other component parts uh, of the application which can be positively uh, appraised. So this is the kind of feedback that I feel uh, to share with, uh, uh, with you on, on this question. Uh, well, so fine. Uh, so, uh, so that's enough uh, from my side uh, concerning the aims, uh, the content, and the structure of these uh, MSc programs. And uh, hopefully, I provided you also some example of uh, the profile of students uh, we have with us and the kind of expectations, uh, the uh, career trajectory which, uh, which they have. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, this is uh, something I was just about to say. If you have uh, any further question, uh, feel free to, to send me an email. As a convener of these two MSc programs, uh, I am the, like the first point of contact. If you have any questions, you can find my details uh, uh, online, uh, but uh, my email is uh, aa144 at uh, soas.ac.uk, and uh, feel free to drop an email. I can just reply, or uh, if you like to have a conversation, which can, we can be in touch on the phone or over, over Skype, whatever is more practical to, uh, to provide any, any clarification. So you're, you're welcome. Uh, di nulla, or de nada, whatever language we use to, to communicate here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks to everyone for attending and for your questions. And uh, uh, hopefully we will meet uh, here at SOAS at some time, uh, sometime, sometime soon. Thank you. Bye.